I think we're going on. Can you see there it, was just a message that said you were live streaming? Yeah, it does say, I think we're live. Hello, yeah. Mike. Oh, I'm Lila Moore, President of Kukua Council, one of Hawaii's oldest advocacy organizations, representing and advocating for the most vulnerable among us. We're joined by colleagues via Zoom and Facebook. Kukua Council's mission is to advocate, inform, and educate to improve the laws and policies which impact our community. Kukua Council's directors are volunteers, watchdogs, and advocates, each dedicated to making our community better and each is active within many other community-minded organizations. Today, Cocoa Council facilitates an educational forum regarding physical and developmental disabilities. My colleague and Cocoa Council's Vice President, Rick Tabor, will lead this forum, and when all guest speakers have spoken, we'll open the forum to questions and answers. Rick, please take it away. Thank you, Lila. And thank you everybody for joining us and thank you for everybody that's watching this um, a little bit later on Facebook or YouTube. We'll have this posted on both um, and folks are welcome to share this with anybody that they'd like to. Um, I know most of you, I know most of you very closely. I know both of you and your incredible work. I appreciate all of you and everything that you've done through the years to help our community, especially those with disabilities of all types. I. You all know probably that I'm 47 years in the field of mental health. I actually started in 1976, petty officer in charge of mental health clinic over at Connie Oi Marine Corps Air Station. Uh, there was a lot that went down. Uh, I graduated from Chaminade and I graduated and quickly became a disability specialist. So through the years, a lot of my work started here. Uh, CICO, ABAC, Autistic Vocational Education Center. Uh, a place called Hawaii Research Center, which is Michael's place now that uh, he'll talk about later. My wife and I actually met there, which is a remarkable story. Uh, Michael has asked me to be on his board, so everything has gone full circle. Behind me, uh, uh, on my screen, I have the Best Buddies Walk, which is Karen Glasser's. This is last year's walk with my puppy. I haven't had time to load this year's. Michael actually in his group, what you have, like 20 people from your group joined us. We had a remarkable day and a remarkable walk. Um, I'm involved in a lot of things. I just counted it up. It actually is officially 17 things. I'm on four boards, officer of several, uh, Doug's Hawaii Meals on Wheels, and this year's vice president, next year's president. Um, Kathy Wyatt isn't here. Um, she's president this year of HPGS, which is Hawaii Pacific Gerontological Society. I was last year's president. And then on and on, <laughs> many things. I won't spend all my time on those things. What I want to say is that the disabilities field, um, in my view, through the years that I've been involved with it, has um, been sadly neglected in a lot of ways. Not by you folks, but funding-wise, support-wise, where we are with it, it uh, basically everywhere in the, in the United States. Seattle, I worked at a place called Seattle Mental Health for 30 years. It's now called Sound Mental Health. The last 10 years that I was there, I was the manager of a developmental disabilities program. It's basically disabilities, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, whole number of things, uh, intellectual disabilities. And we served 20, uh, we served 22,000 people. I want to say 20. Seattle Mental Health, now Sound Mental Health, served over 20,000 people. We did everything from children to older adults. Um, I moved to Hawaii and just kind of fell into the Kapuna world and doing all kinds of stuff with Kapuna and just loved it. But I've always, my heart has been with, with disabilities and the work that we've done with, with, with them throughout the years. Also being a veteran and also being in charge of the mental health clinic. And 10, for 10 years, I was the uh, mental health liaison to medical doctors uh, throughout King County, which is the Seattle area. Worked a lot with folks that had acquired disabilities. And what I wanna say is folks that are born with disabilities, that's all they know. Folks that acquire disabilities have some adjustment to do, either through the trauma of how they acquired it or just adjusting their life, which has now changed. So I, I would say, so I have a little bit of both in myself, certainly mild compared to most folks. I was born colorblind, didn't know that. The colors I see are what I have always seen. I know nothing different, right? So that's being born with something. I was hit by a drunk driver in my sophomore year after making the A squad in wrestling, and I can only raise my right arm that high. It doesn't go any higher than my shoulder. 
So I lost all my scholarship chances. I was pretty active in sports and I ended up joining the military for the GI Bill, which is how I ended up getting my master's in counseling psychology. So that's kind of my world, very minor compared to most. I didn't have to go through a lot of the stuff that some people do. Um, services, finding services. I always say the, the difficulty in the field and some may, may not agree, but it's the system, which tends to be kind of difficult to, to, to hurdle, if you will. So when somebody actually uh, is disabled and they try to get social security, I just kind of Googled to check some numbers. 70% are turned down the first time. Social Security uh, Administration will say that most of that's because the paperwork isn't adequate or there's medical things missing. But our reality in Seattle was when folks applied, they had to apply three times before they actually got it. And sometimes we actually had to have a lawyer. And so there were actual companies that would help us with it. Northwest, the Justice, there was different places that we would use to help folks obtain it. And crazy thing in Seattle, one day I'm watching the news and there's an expose on the news of the very person I was working with in social security, she'd had a car accident and she, she lost her ability to walk. And it was taking her three times to apply to her own department. So I'm just gonna say, we can approach it in a lot of different ways, but the reality is folks need a lot of support just to get the services that they need. I worked with teens, I worked with youth at risk. Every youth at risk that had, if you will, be it a, a learning disability or something more severe, I would very carefully try to help them understand that they can stay in high school through the age of 21. When they, as soon as they turn 22, it's done and all of their services follow them. I would say 80% of them said, forget it, at 18, I'm done. Not realizing, even though I told them, not hearing that all their benefits came to a stop. So what happened in Seattle is people were no longer able, eligible to be in foster care, which was covered or various things. Now I know that in, in the Seattle area, we did a lot of work to try to bridge that. And so I don't know where we're at here in Hawaii with some of that, but that was another hurdle. The biggest hurdle that, that we encountered, um, and, and again, this is in the Seattle area, you guys work with it here, so I'm putting this out there for you just kind of chime in as to what, when you're presenting, what's happening here with some of these things. If a person did not have the testing, and it's mostly IQ testing I'm talking about, but the testing, that deemed them to fall within the category of being disabled, IQ lower than 70, they did not qualify for, develop, for the Division of Developmental Disability Services in Seattle. I worked with a lot of these folks. I did counsel, I had 27 contracts around the state of Washington uh, advocating or helping people, helping counselors work with their folks. Constantly would run into either school systems unwilling to do the testing, not having access to someone that had the time to do the testing or parents that didn't want their kids labeled. So those are the types of, if you will, those were the stumbling blocks we would run into. And then suddenly that young person is 22, 23, 24, and the parents are screaming, oh my God, we're gonna get any help. <laughs> and I'd been working with them and going, wow, we tried, we tried. Um, so those, those are three things I'm just gonna put out there that we ran into. I have more, but I don't wanna take up a lot of the time. I certainly can, as people know, but I'm going to stop there and I'm just gonna start introducing. So here's the order we're going to go, um, just for you and the audience that are watching. So we're gonna have uh, Lewis uh, uh from, he's the executive director for Hawaii Disabilities Rights and Center. He's gonna be our first presenter. And then his intake advocate, uh, Janice Chang, We'll fill in the puka, as she says, so she will follow. Um, each person is gonna have seven minutes to present. Kirby Shaw, Executive Director of Hawaii Department of Hawaii Disability and Community, and he's also uh, Communications Access Board. Um, he will follow uh, Janice then, Kirby uh, will follow them. Uh, Daintree uh, Bartoldis is the Executive Administrator for Hawaii State Council on Developmental Disabilities. She will be next. And we're gonna wrap up with two resources that I think are just seriously valuable here um, in Hawaii. Michael uh, Marsh uh, is uh, the president and CEO of Responsive Caregivers of Hawaii. So he's going to present next. And then we're gonna wrap up with one of my favorite people in the world, Karen Glasser, State Director of Best Buddies of Hawaii. Um, so that's the order we're going to go. We're going to go through everybody 
And then at the end, after Karen finishes, we'll open it up for questions. I hope everybody has questions. The panelists are welcome to ask each other questions as well. We'll do that until 11 or 12.45. At 12.45, we'll give each of the panelists a chance to do two, two minute closure and that'll be it. Now, the last thing I'm gonna say is this is a global overview of disabilities. We're bringing a lot here. We're not so much gonna get into the weeds today and whack our way out. We'll do the whacking our way out later with other presentations. So we're just going to identify some of the things right now. Okay, so without further ado, Lewis, would you like to start? I'm happy to start. Uh, All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you. good morning. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be on this panel. I see so many people that I've known for a, a long, long time. Heck, I've known Kirby for decades, even uh, even going back to when he first worked at BCAB. Uh, when he went to law school, I was happy to be at his law school graduation. And then he did an internship with us, served on our board. Daintree and I go back a long way. Uh, Karen, I've seen a little bit on a community advisory council. Michael, I think I met you when you first came out here. and. And Greg, I'm getting to know, he's a new colleague of mine on the Waikiki Neighborhood Board. Uh, so the Hawaii Disability Rights Center is part of a national system called the Protection and Advocacy System, or PNA. So the simplest way that I sometimes explain it is to say, well, we're a little like legal aid, but, we're, but we focus on disability issues. Uh, and, but I can get into some of the differences. Just a brief history of the whole protection and advocacy system it really goes back to back in the 1970s when Geraldo Rivera was a young reporter. He did an expose on a facility in New York called Willowbrook, where people lived and it housed people who were who had mental health issues or uh, intellectual disabilities. And they lived in these filthy, shitty, crappy, lousy conditions. And uh, Robert Kennedy was our senator at the time. I'm from New York as a kid, originally from Brooklyn. Uh, I then went to college out in the Midwest and lived in New England, and I've been out here for about 30 years. Uh, so anyway, Congress was shocked, so they decided that there ought to be a system in every state to serve as a watchdog agency to make sure that people in these facilities were being treated properly. So they created the protection and advocacy system, and they provided that there should be one in every state. You get designated by the governor of the state. So we were designated by George Arioshi, which gives you some idea that we've been here for a long time. You cannot, the idea is to insulate the agency from politics. So you cannot get redesignated just for being zealous advocates and doing your job. You have to really screw up and steal money or whatever. Uh, so it it, uh, it rarely happens. Uh, and I think that's a good thing because that's what we do. We fight with the state. Uh, we represent people who are clashing with them. So uh, so that's sort of who we are. O over time, the focus of the PNAs shifted away from just monitoring facilities to uh, to helping people in the community uh, have their rights protected. And so so th so that's sort of what we do there. So the misconception sometimes that I think people have, Janice is our intake advocate and our outreach advocate. And she's great. She's right there on the front lines, dealing with the phone calls every single day. Frankly, it's a much harder job than mine. I get to sit in the back and I'm away from that. And uh, and, and so, it's, but Janice is really terrific. So, so one of the misconceptions that I think people have is, uh, is the idea that somehow we're an all-purpose law firm for people with disabilities. The truth is that the issue has to be focused and based on your disability. So if you are a person with a disability and you go out and you get popped for drunk driving or you wanna get a divorce, okay, that's not what we do. Uh, but if you get the scripture fired from your job because of it, if somebody won't rent to you because of it, uh, that's the sort of thing that we do. Uh, a lot of what we do is not always related to the elderly issues, but but there's a tremendous amount of overlap. We do a lot of work with the Developmental Disabilities Division. As Rick was saying, I'm well aware of that whole that whole question of whether you're only moderately disabled versus more severely disabled. We get a lot of those kinds of cases where somebody comes in and you're right to say, hey, I got a 70 IQ. They think I'm like terrific, like I'm good to go. And it's like, well, you know, and so, so I'm we do a lot of that kind of stuff, trying to get people uh, 
services that they're entitled to. We do a lot of work in the mental health area, uh, focusing on uh, trying to get them housing and community-based services. We do a lot of work at the legislature, but we also do overlap a lot with, with the COCUA Council. And I'll just say that the COCUA Council, I've been here say for about 30 years. I worked at the legislature for, for a long time. I was part of the health department administration. I worked for Bruce Anderson his first time around back in the 90s. And so I am very well familiar with the long, really great tradition that the Kokua Council has. I, I mean, I've known Larry Geller and Jim Sean and lots of people. So basically, if you're lucky enough to live long enough, you're going to be elderly, and then you're probably going to be a person with a disability uh, because the law is so broad in terms of the way it defines it. So there really is a lot of overlap. And, and, and I think that it would be good. I'd like to hear some of your issues, and we want to kind of I'd like to look at more ways to partner with your organization, but just as some example, because the DD and, and, the, and the mental health issue may or may not be an elderly issue per se, but we do a lot of work in terms of trying to make transition people away from nursing homes and more restrictive facilities into more community-based ser services. Everybody's good to me, you're much happier, you're much better off if you can if you can age in your own home and have services brought in, uh, or or at least live in sort of a mom and pop care home where you have, where you feel part of a family versus a more impersonal facility. So we do a lot of work trying to focus on that. We do uh, Medicare and Medicaid issues, uh, get trying to get coverage for things. I think that's something that would that would definitely impact the elderly community. Uh, Durable medical equipment, wheelchairs, uh, things of that nature. I'm getting old now and I'm finding that my hearing is going. Now I know why Bernie Sanders and all these guys are always screaming about Medicare and not covering hearing aids. That stuff is <laughs> that's really expensive. I'm like, what? I mean, I was I I was shocked when I saw that. Uh, we do still continue to monitor care homes as, as well. Uh, any kind of facility that a person with a disability lives in. Uh, we did a we, we, we did a vaccine clinic for, uh, on, for during COVID. We did a couple of them uh, focusing on people with disabilities who may have otherwise been somewhat resistant to, uh, to, to going and getting them. Uh, we do a lot of work with the handy van and and the bus. And so there's issues. I see you raising your hand. Am I talking too long or? Uh, we just ran, I'm sorry, you had five seconds when I raised it, but now we go ahead and wrap up. Okay. Uh, well, uh, that's a sampling of some of the kinds of things that we do. Uh, can I give Janice a couple of a couple of a minute or two to introduce herself? Oh, we'll give Janice another seven minutes. You guys get a lot. Oh, well, that's a, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, so what what do you miss, Janice? Uh, okay, thank you so much, uh, Lila and the members of Cocoa Council, and thank you, Lou because uh, Louis is actually the one who extended this invitation to, to us. So thank you so much for having me here as well. Uh, so I'm Janice Chang. I do work as an intake and outreach advocate. So just want to like give some time to Lou that if I don't fill up the seven minutes, he can by all means take whatever five minutes that he wants to talk more about what we do. Um, so I, I'm, I'm actually one of two intake advocates. We have uh, a 15 dedicated, dedicated staff. Our office is based in Honolulu, but we do serve statewide. So I have been in my current position for almost four years. I initially started off as a part-time outreach advocate, focusing on, on and underserved populations, including Micronesians, veterans, and houseless. So through that work, um, since I, my background was really not in the disability uh, community or disability rights, it was I worked at Shamanat University and I got my MBA from Shamanat. So uh, working with students. So by doing outreach, I really got to learn about the community, our community partners, the needs of the community, individuals. So it was really actually very fascinating. And to understand how we can best strategize 
you know, during that time, how to optimize the time in terms of uh, outreaching to community, since we are such a small agency, how do we get the word out that we exist, that we are here to serve our community? Because there are often many who do not, who do not know that we exist. So it's critically important because by the time they come to us, they probably um, were not able to receive services that they need. So we are sometimes their last resort. We do have 10 different programs. Um, so, you know, at some point uh, I can show the 10 different programs. So the one of the newest one is the one about the vaccine, the public health workforce that um, that Lou mentioned about. So that came about in 2021. Um, so, you know, th that's something that we are definitely uh, working toward um, outreaching as well to the community. So what was, uh, you know, after doing outreach, hearing from our callers, there, we actually received a call from parents from a toddler all the way to 100 years old and and then some. So, and anywhere, anywhere in between. What we do stress is that we are not case managers and we don't do social work. However, the work that we do is that we do do individual work, uh, cases. We do systems that uh, Lou mentioned about. And if there are issues that we may not be able to address, what we really do is that we do our best to provide information and referral. So it's not where we want to send our callers just to kind of, um, you know, to just uh, to send them to some place. We don't want to do that. We want to make sure that when we are giving referrals, it's the best agency that we know of. So the way we were able to generate or the way we are able to generate is through the work that we do. So it could be our advocates who are on the neighbor islands, connecting with our, our, our community partners and finding out what they do for their community and so forth. So we we collectively uh, share information and resources on how we can best provide referrals. Um, and um, so hopefully, I mean, our ultimate ultimate goal is to make sure that whether it's us at Hawaii Disability Rights Center or our um, community partners, that we just want to make sure that our population can be served. Um, so that is critically important. So, you know, in a forum like this, so again, thank you so much. This is where we are able to share what we do. So at least let, you know, one of the perks is, um, one, you know, if they don't know if they have a disability, they don't know where to go, they can certainly call us um, and we, we can definitely provide our contact info. And um, uh, when people do call us, we want to make sure that we do also stress that our services are free. We don't look at a person's income, you know, unlike certain um, maybe legal service providers, we do not look at that. What we uh, what we do want to stress is that it is a disability rights issue. So human civil legal uh, 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 rights of uh, persons with disabilities. So um, the things that sometimes we often get calls also is regarding power attorney for health, power attorney for education. Sometimes we get calls about guardianship, but we want to stress that we do not do guardianship. We do what's called emancipation of guardianship. So we do stress the importance of self-determination. It doesn't matter if someone has a disability or not. They should be able to make decisions and they should be able to voice. Um, so another uh, big one of the things that we do is the voter access. So we do, we, I'm sure maybe many of you may have seen campaigns that we did for voter access. So throughout the year, anytime, you know, if they do need assistance, they can certainly contact us. And Lou, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, 30 well, seconds. 30 seconds, okay, yeah, sure. Okay, uh, well, uh, just to follow up on what Jenna says, I have, well, I laugh when we say we don't do social work because we, 
we always say that and we always kind of think that and wish that. And I mean, I'm a lawyer and we're a public interest law firm, but the truth is there's a huge overlap between what we do and social work. I mean, we're not literally case managers, uh, but we will try to make sure that the people who are supposed to do their job will do that. We do have about 10 different programs and, and it, I, I see how the federal government does operate in silos because that's the way our funding, if you if you have mental health issues, it's this pot of money, DD is over here, brain injury is here, and it's very clearly separated out. So uh, there are certain challenges with that, but yes, there's no income guidelines. Unlike legal aid, uh, you, can, you can be rich or poor, it doesn't matter. A good number of our clients, frankly, are on Medicaid uh, or Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, so they tend to be lower income, certainly, but we don't have those kinds of guidelines. So yeah, so I mean, we're here to listen and uh, we're here to partner and help going forward. Fantastic. Very good uh, to hear everything that you guys are doing. And I know there's a whole lot more. Um, so there'll be a two minutes at the end to kind of wrap up. So think about that. Everybody think of your questions. I have a few that come to mind, but right now we'll move over to Kirby. Come on down, Kirby. Uh, that's right, thank you. Hey, good morning, folks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, it's my first time. Um, and I imagine my predecessor, Francine Y, uh, who had my position for uh, roughly 40 years. And so, uh, you know, I'm filling some big, sh big shoes. And so uh, my hat is always off to her. Uh, may she rest in peace. Um, so, uh, my name is Kirby Shaw. I'm the executive director of the Disability and Communication Access Board, otherwise known as DCAP. So uh, I guess a little personal background. I, I uh, am a person with a disability. I'm quadriplegic due to a spinal cord injury that uh, I, I, I got in 1977. I had just about to start college and uh, wham bang, I was on the beach one day and uh, ended up breaking my neck and changed my, my trajectory of life. Uh, and so since then, you know, it's been a interesting experience, but here I am, uh, that was, I was 17 just before my 18th birthday. And now I'm 63 years old and finding like, oh my gosh, now, I'm I'm an old older guy, and uh, and now I'm practicing law. What type of law do I practice? Estate planning, and so even though I'm I'm working for DCAB, um, I'm still you know I was in the practice of uh, doing estate planning and some probate, and um, so I'm still doing some pro uh, no probate anymore, but. Uh, uh, estate planning right now. And I find that uh, just like a, a mechanic, you know, you don't fix your own car, you're fixing everyone else's. And so I, I'm in need of an estate plan. And here I am, I've got all the tools. I've got uh, one in the hopper for myself and my wife, but I didn't pull the trigger yet. So quite interesting there, but that's another story. Um, at any rate, so what is, what is DCAB? DCAB is a uh, state government agency that is composed of 17 governor appointed members, board members who provide policy guidance to 21 staff persons, uh, including myself, we have professional staff. So what do we do? DCAB is a systems advocate for persons with disabilities. So, you know, unlike uh, White Disability Rights Center, we're we don't file lawsuits. Uh, what we do do is uh, when people with disabilities ask us, what are our rights under the ADA or what is the ADA or Section 504, the Rehab Act or the Air Carrier Access Act or um, other um, laws, federal laws that apply to persons with disabilities, the Fair Housing Act uh, and so forth. And so we, can describe what the laws are and what their rights are under those laws and where they can go to 
had them enforced uh, not only federal laws, but also state laws. And we refer them to the appropriate entities or you know, tell them they can file a lawsuit in federal district court or um, in uh, state cases, they can file with a complaint with the Hawaii Disability Rights Center. And again, federal uh, lawsuits or complaints with the US Department of Justice. So we'll walk them through the process, but you know, we can't take cases, but we can provide technical assistance. And so that's a, a main uh, job of our agencies, providing technical assistance to uh, persons with disabilities, their family members, professionals who work with them, as well as state and county agencies through uh, our ADA coordination. So we're designated as the state ADA coordinator for the executive branch of Hawaii. And so uh, we meet periodically with state and county ADA coordinators who, to ensure um, that uh, um, the activities that the executive branch agencies uh, comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA. Um, one, to ensure that uh, state government programs, services, and activities are accessible to persons with disabilities and ensuring that reasonable modifications of policies, practices, and procedures uh, uh, to allow persons with disabilities to participate. So um, oftentimes the way the uh, policies or practices or procedures are set up, they tend to be exclusionary. And so we say, you need to make modifications, reasonable modifications, so long as they don't fundamentally alter the nature of the program, service, or activity, or it doesn't cause a, a financial burden to the agency. So um, in short, that's what we do for ADA coordination. And then uh, DCAP also, and these are background things. I mean, the public doesn't really see this, but DCAP reviews all plans for new construction and alteration of the state and county buildings, facilities, and sites to ensure that the built environment for public facilities is accessible for persons with disabilities. For example, um, wheelchair ramps at intersections, restrooms that have wider um, toilet stalls and grab bars installed, the parking lots of accessible parking spaces, the public housing uh, provides accessible units for persons with disabilities who need uh, accessibility. And then DCAB also tests sign language interpreters uh, and issues a Hawaii credential to those who pass the test so they can uh, perform their services for a fee. Uh, in Hawaii, um, we provide guidance on hiring interpreters. They got five what, seconds? Oh, you're kidding, okay. And then uh, we uh, administer the statewide program of parking for persons with disabilities and, uh, in conjunction contract with the four counties to issue the parking uh, programs. And then, uh, and but mainly uh, I think for, our systems advocacy, it's, it's really um, advocating for persons with disabilities to participate in the mainstream of society. So in, in our overarching systems advocacy, that's what we do. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kirby. You know, I'm realizing I knew it when I got into this, all of you guys, we could probably do one form with each of you and still not cover everything. So I'm sorry for the, the time limit. Um, so I want to make sure everybody has a chance. And certainly when you wrap up, if there's something really key that you missed, please, please throw it in at the end. Okay. Um, so Daintree, I'm actually wearing a shirt for you. I've got a background for Karen and I'm wearing my Seahawk shirt for you. So awesome. this is my, my 12th man buddy here in, in Hawaii. Uh, so Daintree, it's all yours. Thank you so much. I'm going to be sharing my screen. And so I won't be able to see you, Rick, so just holler if I'm going over or what have you. So my name is, oh, let's share screen first, um, share. 
hopefully I do this correct. Um, can you see my screen or did I share the wrong one? We see your screen, but it's your desktop. Oh, ready. Let me. That's a pretty Sorry, cool guys. desktop. <laughs> uh, let me try this again. And. Yep, you're in. Am I still in? You got it. All Perfect. right, awesome. Okay, so my name is Dane Schwartz. I'm the executive administrator for the Hawaii State Council on Developmental Disabilities. I started in this field in 1989 at the ARC in Hawaii. We we're closing down my mono training school and hospital and opening up homes in the community and integrating people. And I went through um, direct service worker, uh, program director, uh, as a case manager, and now I'm the executive administrator. So I went from a micro to a macro level. And so I want to talk to you about uh, the DD Council and what we do. And so um, here I go. Um, so we're an advocacy um, agency. We um, go for systems change. We are a part of the DD. Uh, we support the DD Act. Um, Lou is our sister agency. So we work together. Um, so once we go and advocate for a, bill to, a law to be implemented, Lou makes sure that that law is um, being adhered to. So that's our focus is more on systems change. Um, what does the DED Act say? The council shall serve as an advocate for individuals with developmental disabilities, conduct or support programs, projects, activities to carry this out. Um, we support the final rule, which is a Medicaid rule, and to assure that individuals um, advance self-determination and inclusion in all aspects of community living, housing, education, employment, um, for individuals with developmental disabilities and their families. Oops, sorry about that, guys. My button here is going crazy. Um, action, what can we do? So that's a big thing. People always say, what does the DD Council do? You don't provide direct services. So well, how do you help people with developmental disabilities? And that's through educating policymakers is a huge thing. Um, coalition development and citizen participation, informing policymakers, and demonstration of new approaches to services and supports. The council may support and conduct activities to educate the public about um, capabilities, preferences, and needs of individuals with developmental disabilities and their families including training and self-advocacy, education. Again, you're going to hear me say that a lot, educating policymakers. It's really important to make sure people understand best and promising practices when working for and with individuals with developmental disabilities. We support coalitions that support policy agenda for council, like the Kukua Council. We go and we, and we work together with other individuals to advance the best promising practices for individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, we um, perform um, directly with uh, federal, state, and local policymakers. So we do it on all levels. Uh, we're an attached agency to the Department of Health, and we have a non-interference clause, which is, allows us to work independently. So although we're in housing Department of Health, we advise the director and we advise the governor on best and promising practices for individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, okay, I'm just going to scoot along here. My apologies with this pointer. I, I am so sorry about that. Councils are free to advocate on positions as long as um, we make sure that we talk about facts. We don't put our own personal beliefs in it. We go by best and promising practices. We have a national organization where we get our lead from. We always try to have a balanced approach and we always like to make sure people understand the pros and cons to any topic that does come up. We try to, um, although we're not neutral, we try to make sure that it's unbiased to make sure that when we talk about the pros and cons about something, we're advocating on the position. Um, we are not allowed to lobby, we educate. So that's very important. There are some agencies that lobby, we do not. We really educate to make sure people understand what's being done. And we don't talk about how much funding is needed. We will say funds are needed, but we don't lobby for a certain amount of money. Um, 
Councils lead the way. We provide valuable information to other stakeholders as well. So when people talk about disabilities, that's a very wide variety. Uh, for the DD Council, we're for developmental, intellectual and developmental disabilities. So that's our silo. We really focus on that area for individuals. And um, that's about it. So I zoomed through that pretty quick. So basically we are a resource to anybody sitting here. So when something comes up and somebody has a question regarding a developmental disability, support services, what else is out there? Can my individual get VR services and Medicaid waiver supports and can they work? Can they save money? All those types of questions, we are a resource to you as well as policymakers. Um, so that's really what I wanted to express today is how we are a resource. And if you just say about a disability, we know which agency to hook you up with. And that's also why I brought Debbie in too. I asked her and she might ask questions later on about how we work together and try to make a no wrong door so people could just call one place and we could help them through any questions that they may have. And that's what I have for you. So back to you, Rick. All right, thank you, Daintree. Very good uh, and very helpful. I'll wait with my questions though. I'm, I'm holding back here because I want to hear uh, who's next. Michael, Michael Marsh, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Rick, for inviting me and for agreeing to. There you go. Facilitate my slides. For some reason, I joined the Zoom by iPad and it doesn't interface well with the shared content function of Zoom. So thank you, Rick, for being my tech person. I appreciate it. And thank you to the Kakua Council for having me. I serve as the president and CEO at Responsive Caregivers of Hawaii. Um, but to just give you a little framework of my background, I've been here at RCH, Responsive Caregivers of Hawaii. It'll be five years on August 1st, which is kind of hard to believe that flew by rather quickly. Um, but my background before coming here to Hawaii was in fair housing. So I've heard some fair housing keywords and phrases come up through Lou's presentation and Kirby's presentation. And I have met and worked with the fair housing program through the Legal Aid Society of Hawaii. So I'm glad to see there are folks working on expanding opportunities in housing for people with disabilities because housing is a core to our human existence and very important to our, our overall well being, both physical safety and mental health as well. So, when I started in fair housing in the late 90s in Ohio, just a quick anecdote the highest basis for fair housing complaints or housing discrimi discrimination complaints was based on race. Over the 20 plus years that I worked in fair housing, I noticed a shift in demographics from race-based complaints to disability-based complaints. And that trend has continued throughout the entire country. And now disability is the highest basis for fair housing complaints nationally. And my work in fair housing, I think, prepared me uh, for my role here at Responsive Caregivers of Hawaii. And we are, a nonprofit organization. We were founded back in 1975, as Rick mentioned, as uh, Research Centers of Hawaii by Dr. George Omira. And Dr. Omira believed, as we continue to espouse, that folks with developmental disabilities do not belong institutionalized. They should be integrated into the community like everybody else. So our history is very much involved with dismantling the Waimano Homes Institution here on Oahu. And some of our current program participants are former residents of the Waimano Homes Institution. And we very much believe in integrating them into the community, which you'll see in my uh, upcoming slides about our group homes and our community learning services. But our mission at Responsive Caregivers of Hawaii is to increase independence, productivity, and integration of persons with developmental disabilities and other special needs in Hawaii. You can go ahead and go to the next slide, Rick. So we, we carry out our mission in a variety of ways through different services, group homes, adult day health, community learning services, and of course, transportation is key. So we offer transportation through a contract with the city and county of Honolulu 
whereby we can pick folks up at their residence in the morning, bring them to program. If they choose to go out in the community, we can provide those transportation services to take them on community learning service activities or medical appointments. Residents of our group homes, we also transport them to religious services and social activities as well. Next slide, please. The main core of our programming is adult day health, which is basically daycare. And we serve currently 94 program participants. Pre-COVID, we were 107, and now we're at 100, or excuse me, 94. So we're pretty close to getting back to where we were at pre-COVID levels. And I should step back for a second and let you know that the adult day health, the group homes, the transportation, the community learning services, all of the programs and services that we offer are provided through the person-centered approach. And person-centered is really about focusing care on the needs of individuals and ensuring that people's preferences, their needs and their values help guide our serve our decision, you know, our, our help guide our clinical decisions and provide care that is respectful of and responsive to the individual. We were part of a statewide cohort on the person-centered approach. And as such, we have emerged as a leader and a provider of choice among the provider network throughout Oahu. Uh, there are guiding principles that help to put the interests of the individual receiving care or support at the center of everything we do through person-centered. And some of those examples include individuality, independence, privacy, partnership, choice, dignity, respect, and rights. And I would add compassion to that list. We say where uh, our tagline for responsive caregivers of Hawaii is where, where quality is measured by compassion. And I tell our caregivers every day they're doing God's work because they show such compassion, dignity, and respect to our program participants. Through our adult day health, we have rolled out learning activity stations, which actually came out of the person-centered cohort. I went to some of these meetings that were facilitated by Mary Brogan and the, and the team at the Developmental Disabilities Division and outside consultants, and they talked about this person-centered approach. And I thought, well, how can we do that at Responsive Caregivers of Hawaii? So we wrote grants to Friends of Hawaii Charities to introduce learning activity stations. You'll see in this slide, our culinary arts program, which is the most popular because everybody likes to indulge in Ono grinds, right? But it serves a dual purpose in that it helps our program participants develop life skills and some independence. So if they learn how to make a spam musubi at program and they can do that at home, or even something as simple as a sandwich, it gives their caregiver at home um, a little lightening of their burden because the participants are learning some independence, which gives them self-confidence. So we have culinary arts, we have technology, which is also very popular. We have arts and crafts, we have music and dance, and we have physical exercise, which is so important. And you'll see in the next slide, one of our program participants is very, he's a very talented artist, Leonard Mariano. And we have, uh, through the UNH Disability Studies Program, Make Art Change Lives, which is facilitated by Annie Moriasu at the UH Disability Studies Program. And she has highlighted, she works with our, our program participants and highlights some of them through the PAC RIM conference. And we're working with her to do an art presentation or gallery display of our program participants' talented art creations. And here you'll see Leonard's quote, I currently attend the day program at Responsive Caregivers of Hawaii at Saratoga Avenue, Kapolei, Hawaii. My passion is painting and drawing. He's very talented and she has featured him um, through the Pack Rim Conference as a highlighted artist. Another area, next slide please, that we focus on or provide um, a core cornerstone of our programming is through our group homes. We have a group home in Aiea and one in Kapalama by the Bishop Museum, and they can house four residents each who live there full time with a home health aid manager to help oversee them. And we work with a nutritionist who develops healthy menus for the group home residents. And right now, both of our homes are at full capacity, four residents each, but housing is a very important uh, need for our population. 
The final area that we offer programming around is community learning services. And we've also really expanded this under the person-centered approach. The slide on the left is at Centennial Park in Waikiki, which is a project of the Rotary Club of Honolulu, of which Karen, Rick, and I are all members of the Rotary Club of Honolulu. Excuse me. <laughs> so sorry, I had somebody at my door. Um, through the partnership between Responsive Caregivers and Rotary Club of Honolulu, we send our participants twice a month to go and help with beautification efforts at the park. They learn uh, skills to be independent and they're visible in the community and they interact with Rotarians and other volunteers and they wear their bright colored RCH shirts so they stand out. And uh, another area that we're involved in is the Developmental Disabilities Day at the Capitol. Uh, in March every year, we send our uh, constituency, and you can see them there with the mayor, to advocate for funding for disability services. Other community learning service activities, next slide please, include things like going to the beach is very popular, shopping, parks, dining out. Those things that we tend to sometimes take for granted are very appealing and fulfilling and bring meaning and joy to the lives of our participants with developmental disabilities. We also partner with Mahalo Miniature Horses and they come to visit us. And we also send our participants out to help with chores at Mahalo Miniature Horses. So these are very fruitful partnerships we've developed. We also through grants, uh, through Friends of Hawaii Charities, we pay for admission to Sea Life Park and the aquarium, which are really worthwhile <clears throat> options for our participants if they choose to go and engage, and then well, we have a partnership with the we, Honolulu we, Zoo. We've gone way over because I was doing the slides. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, anything else, Michael, wrapping up? Uh, just our partnership with the zoo. Our participants also volunteer at the zoo. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, okay, well, uh, excellent. And Karen Glasser, you're up. Um, aloha, uh, Rick. Thank you for inviting me and thank you to the Kokua Council for inviting me to talk about Best Buddies in Hawaii. Um, I am the state director. My name is Karen Glasser. I'm the state director of Best Buddies in Hawaii. And I moved here three years ago, about six weeks before, before the world shut down with the pandemic from uh, Alexandria, Virginia, where I ran Best Buddies there for seven years. So I am very, very um, um, practiced in our programs and in our mission. I'm going to go ahead and do a slide presentation here. Uh, so let me share. I'm going to share my slides. And here we go. So sorry. Other things. Sorry about that. This is always fun. This is, I'm like the worst at this because now I've got a menu sitting on top of this and I can't actually see my slide presentation. You can grab the menu and slide it down. Yeah. Give me one second. So sorry, guys. Here we go. And here we go. Okay. So. We are Best Buddies. Uh, Best Buddies is actually a, a national organization, an international organization. So Best Buddies International was founded in 1989 by Anthony Kennedy Shriver, um, whose mother, Eunice, founded Special Olympics and, of course, was very, very active in um, uh, the ADA. So uh, he started Best Buddies in 1989 at Georgetown University when he observed that uh, he would go to Special Olympics events and see uh, people with disabilities, children and adults with disabilities participate, and then they would go back to segregated classrooms or segregated community centers. And he really wanted that, that um, inclusion everywhere in the community. So it started with one-to-one -one friendships in the schools and has branched out. Okay. Good heavens.
Okay, so again, we are a global nonprofit dedicated to inclusion for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We are in all 50 states and we are actually in 47 countries as well. We have offices in about 30 states, but we have programs in all 50. We have four key mission pillars. One is one-to-one -one friendships between people with and without disabilities. You'll hear me refer to people without disabilities as either people without IDD or neurotypical peers. Uh, we also have a leadership development component. We have integrated employment, which is always minimum wage or higher, integrated workspaces, and as Michael talked about, person-centered, always about what the participant wants what he or she wants and then we have a program that is inclusive living right now inclusive living is only in washington dc miami and um, just outside of la so it's only in three states right now the biggest program we have is our one-to-one -one friendships so we are building relationships between people with and without disabilities in organic one-to-one -one friendships we tend to work with chapter advisors, school advisors, both from the special education and general education uh, departments so that we can match students based on shared interests, similar ages and so forth, so that these relationships are organic and that they function um, really, really um, honestly and truthfully. Uh, we have programs from middle school up, although we do have elementary school programs in our in our arsenal, as it were, um, we have in Hawaii 36 school friendship chapters across the state. We have 11 chapters on Maui, including one on Lanai and one on Molokai. We were able to open those this summer. It's very exciting. And then the remainder are on Oahu. Again, 36 school friendship chapters. So that's elementary, middle, high school, and college. Now these friendship programs also uh, include citizens. When our, when our students age out of the school system, as you've heard referenced, um, anywhere between the ages of 18 and 21, a lot of times things go quiet. They have the opportunity to meet their peers and spend time with their peers in high school, especially public schools where special education is so present. But once they graduate or age out of that school system, the opportunities are somewhat diminished. There aren't a ton of programs for people with disabilities who age out of school. Um, so it is, it is, we are thrilled to be able to bring some of these social inclusion programs in uh, to the state. Um, citizens is adults 18 and older in one-to-one -one friendships, people with and without disabilities, again, matched in these friendships based on shared interests and with citizens also based on proximity because we don't wanna put someone from the North Shore with someone in, Honolulu, they're never going to see each other given what it takes to get from point A to point B with any level of traffic. So we really do try and make sure that folks are similar ages, similar likes, and, and also uh, a decent proximity. We opened Citizens in March of 2021 virtually because, of course, during COVID, as did everyone, our numbers plummeted. Uh, folks were tired of being online, so the last thing they wanted to do was hop on a a Zoom call at the end of their school day or work day to participate. Um, so we started it as a virtual program and it really actually took off. We are now at about 60 participants in our citizens program, about half and half, half Maui, half Oahu. And we continue to grow that program out. It's a fabulous program. We also have eBuddies for folks who maybe don't want to do that one-to-one -one, um, um, in-person friendship. This is an email pen pal program and you get matched with someone outside of the state. Really kind of a fun program and a little bit um, easier sometimes for people who have really, really full schedules or calendars or can't get away to meet in person regularly. So again, when we talk about our one-to-one -one friendships, we are talking about um, folks like Teresa and Paula. Teresa, the woman on the left, actually spoke at our recent friendship walk. And um, Teresa and Paula met in 2020 at UH, and they are still very, very dear friends. It is an organic friendship. Oh my goodness, really, already? Okay, dokie. Um, so we ran a bunch of programs during COVID that were virtual. We continue to run those programs for our participants who want to stay virtual. Again, these are our numbers. We serve currently 
directly serve about 402 people and our total impact is about 4,000 across the state. I wanna talk real quickly about our leadership development program ambassadors and how we train our participants to write and give advocacy speeches so they can speak on their own behalf. That is really important to us. You will see our participants speak at every event we have. Integrated employment is a program we would like to bring here. Currently, we are looking to bring transitions, which is a workforce readiness program to our participants. We are looking for funding for that. Inclusive living, as I said, is not here yet. And then there's our friend Paolo with Citizens. His mom wrote this letter and Audrey, who is a state ambassador and on our advisory board. And she talks about the value of best buddies as well. So I'm happy to share this uh, PowerPoint with anybody who's interested, email us at hawaii at bestbuddies.org and reference this slideshow and I can send it to you. These are volunteer opportunities. We are looking for folks to join us at every single level, whether it be programmatic, fundraising, committees, community members, we are all about outreach. We want to make this world a more inclusive space. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Maybe you can send me the slides and we'll just share it with, with folks. Sure. So a whole lot absolutely. Of folks that, absolutely. That aren't here. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So, well, that concludes the beginning part of this. Now for the question. So, as Lila mentioned, if you'd raise your hand if you have a question. Um, and I might actually just start with the question that I have. And this is to everybody. So Kakua Council generally, we, we work a lot with Kapuna. And part of my concern is, and I think Dantry, you and I had a little bit of conversation, there's an awful lot of folks here on the island. I know some personally that have never been diagnosed. They've aged out, they're no longer in Easter Seals, they have no services, and uh, they have issues. They're, they definitely have disabilities. Um, but that's the one part of it is, what are the numbers of folks that we need to kind of reach out to to help them get assessed? Can we get them assessed? Can we get them services? Second part that question is, I know in Seattle, and I am guarantee it's here as well, folks, guardians, folks, parents, folks, caregivers are passing on and they're living so much longer, these individuals, because of our health issue. What happens? What are we doing with those? And who are they? And maybe those are some of the unenrolled folks. So kind of, you know, I'll just, Pump it all in. Maybe I'll start with you, Dantry, on that one. Yeah. Um, thank you, Rick. So what we're doing, actually, we have a bill in legislation right now to do yep. a study to try to figure out where those individuals are and what we can do for them. And so it's um, so important to hooking up. I mean, like this forum and such is so important so we can do outreach because a lot of people don't think there's anything else to do and they're staying at home. We get calls from a brother or sister that says, hey, my mom always took care of my brother. Now he's passed on and we don't know what to do. And so, yeah, hook up with this. We have Hawaii Disabilities Rights Center as well that could help the individual. There's ways to access needs that are out there. We also have our self-advocacy advisory council that we try to hook people up in high school. So as they come into adult age, we could help them hook them up with services through VR and such. And so, Rick, there's not a clear answer for that, except for um, contact the DD Council, where, where we'll help you out through those, um, not necessarily, I shouldn't say hoops and loops, um, but just to navigate, because it is kind of a um, treacherous road, if you're not, it's like going on a new road that's all curvy and it's dark out and you don't have any headlights on. Well, let us help you turn those headlights on. And there are support services out there, and we'll help navigate that. And Greg, I see okay. your hand up, so Rick. Yep, go ahead, Greg. Thank you. Lower my hand first. Um, yeah, I have a, a question and it can be for any of the, the panel to step up and um, try to provide a response. I live in a, a large uh, condominium association, so we have about 183 units here. And one of the Kapuna here, uh, sadly, she's in the hospital right now, but. Uh, she's lived here for a, a very long time. Her husband passed away years ago. She speaks English, but she's born in France. So she speaks better French than I think she does English. Um, sadly, I, you know, I had interacted with her. I was trying to help her with a food situation. She wasn't getting out regularly to get food. And at some point she wasn't paying her, you know, her bills for the maintenance fees, things like that. So I had to help intervene 
we had another owner that was a neighbor of hers across the hall that was helping her. Sadly, he passed away recently. Uh, the wife is still surviving. So my question is when you have someone like that, that um, and she doesn't have any locals here, she's very um, scared of the, you know, a lot of people, the trustworthy. She has a sister that's in France, but nobody that could really help her. And I was trying to advocate or try to help with Rick. I, we, we had a discussion about this a while back, but how, how do we address a Kuna like that? And how do we get her assistance where an advocate can step in that's not a relative and, and actually do something? Because right now I think she's at the Queens Medical Center. I'm not sure if she's back home yet. Um, but how do we really assist with that? Hi, this is Daintree. Um, I really, when we get these questions, we refer them to the Aging Disability Resource Center, ADRCs. And they have really been a wealth of information to help individuals like that. On our council, um, we have different representatives from different agencies, and Philip On is the one here. I see Christina and Debbie is on, but um, to the Executive Office on Aging. But there is the website, ADRC, you can just Google it, ADRC.org, I believe it was what it is. And there, there's links, there's resources, they could call a number, and they could really help you through that. Lou? Yeah, I mean, depend, depending on her diagnosis, I mean, there may be services that, that she's eligible for, whether it's uh, either through private insurance or if she's on Medicaid, whether it's somebody to come in and help her. Uh, Janice has a good handle on some of the kinds of things that 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 uh, people are generally eligible for. So certainly, if you wanted, if you ever wanted her to call us, uh, we, uh, I could have her. I could plug her in with Janice, and, and we could talk with her. And uh, we often get calls like that uh, as well. Uh, I guess while I'm talking, just if I could comment on the last question uh, that I think Daintree ably addressed, uh, and no pun intended, but ABLE was one of the programs I was going to mention when you, when you talk about uh, uh, this phenomenon of people with disabilities living longer and then their parents passing on, what do you do? Uh, there are things such as special needs trusts and things like that. I mean, we're not really, at, Kirby probably has more expertise in that than I do. I mean, we don't draft them here, but there are things like that. But one of the programs that Daintree is really taking the lead on is this thing called ABLE, E-B-L-E, and it allows uh, it allows people with disabilities to build up a nest egg without impacting any potential eligibility for Medicaid or Social Security. So, uh, so that's also a very important thing. I, I think if somebody is, if there's an aging parent of a child with a disability and they're looking to do some long-range planning, these are the kinds of things that they could look at. Uh, and we, you know. I mean, we may not do those here, but we can refer them. And because again, following up on what Jana said, when we talk about what we call an INR, an information and referral, uh, a lot of times I'm a strong believer that even if we don't do something directly here, knowing who to call is really valuable. I mean, being yeah. it, knowing what resources and knowing a, as, a, as opposed to just scatter shots, send them wherever, knowing exactly the right place to send them to is, is, is a huge help. Yeah, that's, that's everything right there is knowing the resources. And so even being able to call somebody like Janice, and if, if it's not her, being able to for Janice to send to somebody, not to say we don't provide anything and exactly. end the conversation there, that's everything. I think Dale has his hand up. Go ahead. I think Kirby no. had his hand up to oh, answer first? the question. Right. Oh, okay, Kirby. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kirby. Go, go ahead. Go. Um, I, all right, let me real quickly and... Uh, just to address the question about the the, the resident with uh, who speaks French, and so we do have a colleague, um, and it's the Office of Language Access. And so, if you need an interpreter uh, who speaks French to help uh, uh, converse and discuss uh, matters, then you can always contact the Office of Language Access at the state agency and they could help facilitate uh, an interpreter. Uh, thank you for that, Kirby. One, one thing I should have mentioned, I, I think I wasn't 100% clear, and, and thank you so much for that, is that this woman has some dementia um, and she's not really capable of 
I think, you know, acting on her own behalf at this stage of, of, of life for her. So it's a position where somebody needs to come in as an advocate and actually, and it's hard because you don't have power of attorney. Um, the sister is in France. They're not here. So, you know, it becomes a, a very odd situation. She's not going to call on her own. Someone has to call either with her or you know, on her behalf. So that's the, the thing that I was concerned about. Thank you very much for that extra information. Maybe that would be helpful if, if I could get her on a call and someone was speaking French to her. So I appreciate that. So Greg, I just want to mention um, that Catholic Charities has Circle of Dementia. Jody Michan, I believe is her name. So they, they she may be able to also help. And they do collaborate with Alzheimer's Association to advocate for people with dementia and Alzheimer's. Yeah, Joey, thank, thank you very much. I just wrote that. Thank you. And Greg, you see in the chat, there's some links for you. Okay. Um, <laughs> we have Dale with a question, but Lila, we're at 10, 1246 on my clock. What do you recommend, President? Why don't we go ahead with Dale's question? Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, okay. Dale. <laughs> okay, sure is. That's what you question, like your thoughts from either uh, Kirby Lewis or Janice. Uh, we had on uh, the ADA with the dealing buses, and I noticed that, especially elderly, when they're pushing their carts of groceries, they really appreciate that, you know, even though they're not certified or whatever to get that service, they appreciate it. I like it too. Anyhow, real fast. Today, about 40% of our population live in these homeowner associations. About voting rights. Well, they have elections too, but the industry of management people got the state in 2005 to make voting conditional that you have to attend a meeting in person to cast your own vote. And I've been thinking that since we can't persuade the legislators to undo that damage, it's probably going to take a federal tort for disability access for mobility challenged people, which would also benefit the investors who cannot attend the meeting because they don't live on the island, you know? So what do you think about uh, at least writing a letter to the state asking them to make uh, voting rights accessible to people who are mobility challenged or simply cannot attend? Thank you. Lou, did you want to grab that one? Well, uh, this is an issue that I mean, I mean, Greg, you, I know you have a lot of insight. This is sort of the kind of thing that we were discussing a little bit in the context of the Waikiki of the Waikiki Neighborhood Board. Uh, I mean, condominiums are, you know, again, I'm so old, they hardly had condominiums when I was in law school. I think so. I mean, I think they started to teach homeowners associations, I mean, but, but property law didn't really cover that, but condominium law has just boomed in the last, in the last decades. And uh, it, it's, a, it's tricky. It's a, it, I mean, I was an AOAO president for four years. I hated it. <laughs> it was, uh, it was not a lot of fun, but, but, and you can get into a lot of problems. Uh, I think the idea of a mail-in ballot for a condominium election is probably a good one. I and mean, this is Greg and I have actually discussed that. I think that kind of makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, I know there was a result. I wasn't able to attend the last neighborhood board meeting because I had COVID, but I know there was some discussion about a resolution to, uh, to sort of support a, a variety of things like creation of an ombudsman and uh, maybe eliminating proxy voting and substituting mail-in voting. Uh, I think these are all reforms that potentially would make some sense. Uh, I, I think there was some resistance to the idea of eliminating proxy voting. And I think that needs to be further refined, whether, I mean, whether it should be sort of a volume, you have to give you the option to do it. But yeah, I mean, I think, I think the idea that, uh, I guess the condominium form of self-governance is, uh, is becoming so prevalent that I guess I should I shouldn't be shocked that they're subject to potentially the same abuse as every other form of government is it's just uh, it's it's very but it's very close to the people literally 
so yeah, I think I personally think it's not a bad idea. And it's, also, I put in, I'm sorry, Kirby, I put in the chat too. We do have a um, statewide elections accessibility needs advisory committee. And although this was looking at the whole wide state um, during elections, but I know they want to dig in deeper into um, different, and Pat Morrissey is on there. In her condo, I know that she's working on changing different laws within that. So that might be a good um, advisory committee to um, pop onto. And um, you don't have to be a member, but anybody, any citizen can join that or listen in on it and give recommendations to that committee. That's an excellent idea. The, Sorry, the, Kirby. Yes, yeah, sure. This is Kirby. And I, I'm, I'm not sure of the, the approach, but under the Fair Housing Act, uh, one as a person with a disability could uh, make a request for a reasonable accommodation, uh, and that would be a modification of the policy uh, that you have to be present to vote uh, and because of your disability. So it would be uh, one person making that claim to uh, for an accommodation. So um, that might be one approach uh, per person to make that claim, not as a group, but as an individual saying, I cannot attend because of my disability and therefore uh, can I vote uh, uh, remotely. Okay, all excellent ideas, input and everything. So we've, we've gone a little bit over. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, oh, go ahead, Lila. Oh, no, well, I'm just going to say I'm going to I'm going to forego my two minutes and allow you folks, the presenters, to kind of take a couple of minutes just to wrap us up. Um, I think it's been an excellent presentation, and I'll just say, like I said in chat, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. This is exactly what I was hoping for. Um, you guys are. I, I know in the field. I will say I know in the field. I've been in mental health for 47 years working with disabilities, mental health, youth at risk, very uh, adjudicated folks. I mean, the toughest of the toughest, mostly in Seattle, King County. And what we always look for, our saving grace is folks like you that can not just think outside of the box, but have the experience and, and, our, and the courage to take on whatever has to happen to make things happen. So with that, I'll just say really, really thank you very much. And I'm gonna go back around, is that okay, Lila? And have Lewis take a couple of minutes and each person will just take a couple minutes to wrap up. Uh, Lewis, and I'll be I'll be a strict timer this time. I'll actually say time's yeah. up. Well, I, I think I think it'll be easier for you this time. I don't have that much more to add. I mean, uh, but uh, I do appreciate the panel. I learned some things. I appreciate what Karen said about best buddies. I didn't really know exactly what they did, and 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 I think I think that would that really crystallize it. Uh, I'm, I didn't. I, I knew Michael provided a lot of programs, but I didn't know the full range of some of those programs. So I would. So I. I really found both of those presentations to be very informative. Uh, yeah, I mean, Greg and I have talked about this condominium issue. I mean, I, and I guess that's a big. That, that's a bigger issue at the, for the Kokua Council. So uh, I would certainly be interested, I mean, either in the capacity of the Disability Rights Center or as a neighborhood board person or whatever, uh, I would certainly be, be interested in, in potentially discussing more of that uh, just to, to learn what are the depth or the severity of that. But I hope you got some idea, especially the folks that are listening out there in cyberspace or wherever they are, uh, get some idea of what we do. And if you think that we could be of any help, yes, again, we provide free legal services to people with disabilities, uh, as long as the issue is disability related. And we also provide a lot of information to try to steer you in the right direction. So uh, we hope that anybody out there will feel free to call. I mean, that's, we're here to help people. So, uh, and our funding is pretty good, actually. We're funded by the federal government mostly. So unlike some of my colleagues here, I don't really have to go out and do a lot of fundraising, which is great, thank goodness. Uh, we are pretty consistently funded. Uh, even it's been bipartisan, whether it's been a Republican administration or a Democrat, they've generally been pretty supportive of our, of our funding. So uh, we're in pretty good shape and we're here to help people as much as we can. All right, exactly two minutes. Janice, you wanna add anything to that? 
please call us at 808-949-2922. Also, our application is available online at hawaiidisabilityrights.org. And walk-ins are also welcome. But certainly, if uh, anybody has questions, what I recently realized is that anyone who calls, picks up the phone, and asks questions are very courageous. So by all means, need help, please reach out. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay. Kirby, how about you? How would you like to wrap this up? Oh, sure. Well, you know, uh, I started to mention that we uh, decap issues uh, disability parking permits uh, through the counties, and we issue them here as well. Uh, but did you know that there are over 100,000 Hawaii residents that have a disability parking permit? That is the people with some sort of mobility disability. So, and 80% of the permittees are over age 60, or roughly 87,882 uh, persons uh, over the age of 60 have a disability parking permit. Um, I, I did want to say, though, that, you know, the, the issue of housing, very important, uh, you know, for uh, the Kupuna with uh, disabilities especially. So in our uh, testimonies on housing bills, we're calling for not the minimum uh, uh, number of accessible uh, units that are required by law, but uh, for the state to exceed uh, the minimum requirements uh, for accessible units, because we know that there are more people as our population ages, there's gonna be a need for more accessible units. And so instead of walk-ups, we're calling for uh, installation of elevators. So the top floors will be accessible because as people age in place, they're gonna need uh, accessibility. So. That's one of the big deals for us. Okay, Thank you. good point. Um, can I add on that? My, my dream is that all of Hawaii has sidewalks so people can get around. It's a, it's, oh. it's a huge factor that just blows me away that we don't have that here. Thank you, you're not. Nothing, I put everything in the chat, so carry on. Okay, all right, Michael. Thank you, Rick. I'm proud to say that I actually work with several of the folks on this Zoom call to expand opportunities for adults with developmental disabilities. I'm not sure if I was clear in my presentation about a couple of things. At Responsive Caregivers of Hawaii specifically, we only serve adults, so 18 plus folks transitioning out of high school all the way up to Kukua, um, I'm sorry, Kapuna. We have people in their 80s, so it's a whole spectrum and they interact really interestingly to, you know, with, the, with one another on all different levels. Uh, most of our, all actually all of our current program participants pay for our, their services received by our agency with the Medicaid waiver. So I take every opportunity to underscore the importance of Medicaid and the waiver program. Uh, we advocate, I'm also president of the Hawaii Waiver Providers Association Board of Directors. So we've been advocating to all of our elected officials to increase the state budget, uh, to meet the needs of the Developmental Disabilities Division under the Department of Health. And we always remind our elected officials, and just so all of you know, for every dollar that the state puts in to Medicaid, we get $1.25 from the feds, so it's a no-brainer. And we also are active, our agency, personally I serve on the True Cost Coalition through the Hawaii Alliance of Nonprofit Organizations, so we've been advocating to the state to enter into their contracts for services with nonprofits at the true cost of service delivery. Because what happens all too often is the state will pay X amount, the nonprofit will accept it, and then the nonprofit is charged with raising up the funds to meet the difference. And that's challenging, very challenging. It takes away from time for services because we have to go out and raise money to make up the the missing piece of finance, of funding for these programs, these vital community services. So it's very important that when we're all talking about this with our elected officials that we advocate that they reimburse nonprofits at the true cost of service delivery. And the final piece I'll add is in response to Rick's last question about aging parents, there's an individual on Oahu, Sue Burke, 
who founded her own nonprofit called Fuller Lives. And she has an adult child son with developmental disabilities and she's aging and she's fully aware of, you know, the fact that, hey, we're going to pass away someday and we're worried about what's going to happen to our kids, right? So she has come up with some barriers or come against some barriers at the state with trying to turn her own personal home into a group home. So I know there are hurdles and obstacles in obtaining our goals of meeting the needs for people with disabilities. So it does take all of us working together. And I, I don't know if she's reached out to Lou or not in that process, but she may uh, if she hasn't. Um, but she's run up against some obstacles trying to turn her own residence into a group home to prepare for the future so that her son can age in place. And that's all I have. Thank you again. All right. Thank you. Karen, wrap us up. I will wrap us up. Okay, thank you again for having me. Um, as Michael referenced, um, we actually serve children and adults with disabilities. So we do that, that spectrum, that continuum of services from childhood through adulthood. Um, we also offer sen uh, sensitivity trainings and other trainings for people without disabilities who maybe aren't quite sure how to get involved. So please reach out to us with regard to that. Almost all of our services are free, all but one, supported employment, which we don't even have here yet, but are working to bring here. So our services are free. So yes, we fundraise, fundraise, fundraise. We are lucky enough to get um, about half of our funding through government agencies, um, both uh, on the state and federal level. Uh, the remainder is private funds. So it's foundations, it's big fundraisers and things like that. We, so we will see us out and about in the community. We actually have, uh, we had a friendship walk this past weekend on Oahu um, and we have one coming up on Maui on the 29th at Maui Mall Village and also a hike in Volcano National Park uh, also on the 29th. Um, those are part of the fundraisers. So that's another way to get involved with our organization, organizations like us that do, do look for private funding and thank you all for your support. Again, Hawaii at bestbuddies.org, that's us. Come join us. Um, we, would love, we want everybody to be a member of our Ohana and we want our programs in every school on all of the islands. Outstanding. Lila, do you have anything in closing? Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules. This is an excellent educational program, learning about the services you offer, but also the obstacles, the challenges, the hurdles you face. So that was uh, very uh, interesting. Um, on behalf of Cocoa Council and our co-sponsors, the Hawaii Alliance for Retired Americans, I'd like to invite you to join us next month in our yearly legislative review, affectionately known as the good, the bad, and the ugly, which will be held in person in room 329 at the Capitol on Wednesday, May 24th. More information will be provided mid-May. Thank you very much. Really appreciate all the presenters, the information it was educational, and I'll be in touch with you with some concerns for some of the people I advocate for. Thank you, mahalo. Please stay well, malama pono. Thank you. Then you're gonna pause the uh, recording. Yay! I think <laughs> you're still, still live Facebook. Still, still live on live. Facebook. Now, careful what you say. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to take Lewis up on your, your offer for some people I work with um, regarding condominium issues and disabilities. But thank you, everyone. Really yeah, appreciate it. Sure. Please stay well. That would be fine. I'm, I'm going to end the meeting now. Thank you. All right. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.